On this Wednesday night, the workers who died in Baltimore's bridge collapse. You know, you come to America trying to reach the American dream and you lose your life. The hurdles in the recovery mission and how the disaster will disrupt supply chains. Traumatized by the Nova Scotia massacre, a community's continued lack of faith in the RCMP. Escaping Haiti. It is total chaos. The Canadians forced to plot their own exit strategy. And hopping from charming to alarming. No, I don't like that. What happens when artificial intelligence meets the Easter Bunny? Global National with Donna Friesen. Good evening and thanks for joining us. Investigators are collecting evidence from the cargo ship that caused the catastrophic collapse of Baltimore's Francis Scott Key Bridge. The data recorder from that cargo ship still stuck in the middle of the river has now been recovered. At least eight people were on that bridge and they were thrown into the water. Two have been rescued, and late today, authorities say two bodies have been recovered from the water. Crews had been searching for others who are presumed dead. The men from Mexico and Latin America were working overnight fixing potholes on the bridge. They would have had no warning before disaster struck. Though crew members on the ship did issue a mayday call that allowed officers a few precious minutes to close the bridge to traffic. Joel Senek is near that bridge collapse tonight. Joel. Yeah, Donna, that tragic news coming just minutes ago here in Maryland. Officials confirming that they did pull this morning two bodies from the water, a 26-year-old and a 35-year-old. Those bodies trapped in a red pickup truck under around uh, 25 feet of water and they are now moving this from a uh, search and recovery operation to a search and salvage operation but that only comes after many hours of hard work faced with an underwater obstacle course divers work below the water's surface as a search and rescue effort transitioned into a recovery operation they are in frigid conditions they are down there in in, in darkness where they can literally see about a foot in front of them. They are trying to navigate mangled metal. The mission to recover the bodies of the construction workers presumed dead. Miguel Luna is one of them. An immigrant support group says he was from El Salvador, a father who had lived in Maryland for 19 years. It's tough. Angelo Solero runs a Latino cultural organization in Baltimore. You know, you come to America. <laughs> You know, trying to raise your family, uh, trying to reach the American dream, and you lose your life. Two Mexican nationals, two people originally from Guatemala, and one Honduran are also confirmed to be among the dead. Solero says their loss will be felt by the entire community. Those are human beings who were working on that bridge to keep that bridge going, and because of this tragedy, they lost their lives. As the scope of the tragedy becomes clearer, Questions remain over what led up to the collision and quick collapse. The vessel's voyage data recorder is now in the hands of investigators. It's like an airplane's black box and is being analyzed. Search crews had more items on their list when they boarded the ship Wednesday. We will be looking for any sort of electronics, documentation. We will want to take pictures. We will want to look at the engine room of the vessel, uh, the bridge. Now, officials say they believe there are other vehicles still underwater, but they are encased in concrete and the debris that fell when the bridge collapsed. Donna, they say they've exhausted all efforts to find the remaining victims. All right, Joel Senek near Baltimore tonight, thanks. About 5,000 transport trucks cross that bridge in Baltimore every day, and the port, one of America's biggest, is now closed indefinitely. There are 4,700 containers stuck on the ship that hit the bridge, two of which went overboard. Billions of dollars worth of goods will now have to be rerouted, and Gaviola is looking at the impact on the supply chain, including in Canada. It's a huge economic impact for the country. This port is responsible for over 51 million tons of foreign cargo. Before this tragedy struck Baltimore's port, it was the ninth busiest in the U.S., handling the highest volume of car and truck shipments. If you've purchased or are thinking of purchasing a high-end vehicle made in Europe or Asia, expect delays and less selection. You might go to your dealer and you have less options 
and a higher price. The head of Canada's Auto Parts Manufacturers Association says this disruption is comparable to, though shorter and more limited in scope, than the microchip shortage during the pandemic years. It's akin to uh, one uh, major uh, uh, ramp or, or intersection at uh, on the 401 being closed. Yes, you can find your way home or you can find your way to work, but likely what will happen is it's going to clog uh, all the other arteries. Vehicles and other shipments held up in and around Maryland will have to find their way through the ports of Halifax, Montreal, or even Vancouver. Other goods impacted may include coal, sugar, and farm equipment. The timing isn't good for farmers who depend on heavy equipment like tractors. So unfortunately, we are seeing planting season approaching here in the United States, especially for corn that'll be going into the ground um, heavily in April. Economically, the greatest impact will be on Maryland's locals. For the families of those presumed loss, uh, for the people of Baltimore who are going to be feeling this closure in day-to-day -day life and for everyone affected by the port closure and its supply chain impacts, the president and the whole government will be here with you. Maryland State Senate President Bill Ferguson says an emergency bill is being drafted to provide income replacement for affected workers. Though the bridge collapse isn't expected to have a major impact on international shipping, the worry is that the cumulative effect of this port shutdown, plus pressure from attacks by Houthi militants on the Red Sea, and a drought in Panama that has snarled traffic in the Panama Canal, all add up. Anne Gaviola, Global News, Toronto. The deadline is looming for some businesses that took federal loans during the pandemic. The Canada Emergency Business Account, or CBA, gave out almost $50 million to nearly 900,000 businesses to help keep them afloat when COVID-19 hit. It was a lifeline, but as Abigail Beeman explains, tens of thousands of businesses are still struggling to find a way to pay it back. Watchmaker Jason Gallup's story is a memorable one. Hard to believe that one digit was a $10,000 mistake. Deemed ineligible for his SIBA loan because he entered one wrong digit. He spent years trying to fix the problem with the government and rebuilt after his business was destroyed by fire. But now he's still stuck, waiting to hear about debt collection and pushing for resolution. The government can fix things. That's why they're the government. So why are they not fixing it? We are hoping that the CRA auditors will be able to fix this problem and still allow access to the forgivable portion if it is something incredibly minor. The Canadian Federation of Independent Business says hundreds of businesses are in similar positions. And according to the CFIB, of the nearly 900,000 businesses that took a CBA loan, 200,000 had to refinance to keep the forgivable portion, taking a loan on a loan. It's pretty worrisome right now. There are fewer business starts than is normal, and we have more business failures than is normal. Canada's business population is shrinking. Sold my car, got rid of my place, um, sold my condo. Fanny Garnier says it's a blessing her business survived. Ontario salons were hit especially hard by lengthy lockdowns and then bans on services without masks, tough in the facial business. She's one of the 200,000 and says she wouldn't have made it without a private loan from Merchant Growth. Sort of builds up as you get towards the deadline and it's getting really busy again now. With an estimated 50,000 businesses looking to repay before Thursday's deadline to keep the forgivable portion. Never stop fighting because having a business, it's a daily fight and just never let your guard down and just keep going, never stop. The federal finance minister's office isn't hinting about any relief before Thursday, nor would they answer questions about why they haven't fixed watchmaker Jason Gallup's case. Abigail Beeman, Global News, Ottawa. The head of Canada's inquiry into foreign interference revealed today six days of testimony were recently held without media or public involvement. Commissioner Marie-José Og says she wants as much information as possible released, but that some details must be kept secret to protect national security. Today, there was compelling public evidence from diaspora communities in Canada who detailed how their lives have been affected by foreign interference. David Aiken was listening. Well, Donna, this inquiry is focusing on allegations of interference by the governments of Russia, India, China, and it's being asked to add Iran to that list. And not surprisingly, it is Canadians who have roots in those countries who were keen to tell their stories. But now they're deporting him instead of 
putting him on a trial. Whether it is Iranian Canadians, the community doesn't feel safe and uh, they're worried. The or Russian Canadians. Uh, Russians have many different opinions, uh, Russian Canadians especially, and they are not always able to voice these opinions because they fear retribution. Intimidation by agents of foreign regimes here in Canada is a very real thing. Indian consulates act as a hub for espionage and foreign interference and transnational repression targeting the Sikh community. And they'll target anyone who's vocal. Indeed, India is accused by Prime Minister Justin Trudeau himself of being involved in the 2023 murder of a Sikh activist in BC. How is that for impact? That's the cost of foreign interference in this country and not taking it seriously. The inquiry heard foreign actors use many other methods. The first is disinformation and news manipulation, and the second is direct and indirect threats against members of the Russian-Canadian community. Next up for this inquiry on Thursday, Canada's chief electoral officer and the officials responsible for investigating breaches of Canada's elections laws. Donna. Okay, David Aiken in Ottawa, thank you. Police in Toronto have arrested seven people and laid 150 charges after a months-long undercover investigation into auto theft. The investigation called Project Paranoid began last April, building on separate drugs and firearms trafficking investigations. Police say 48 stolen vehicles worth nearly $4 million were recovered. The head of the RCMP admits the force made mistakes during the worst mass shooting in Canadian history. It is the first time a top-ranking officer has said those words since the tragedy in Nova Scotia nearly four years ago. In April of 2020, a gunman disguised as a police officer killed 22 people over a 13-hour period. The RCMP commissioner claims since then the force has changed. But as Heidi Petrachik reports, families of those who died are underwhelmed. After admitting he hadn't yet read the Mass Casualty Commission's final report a year ago, Wednesday, the RCMP's top cop acknowledged... The report itself is clear. We've made mistakes. The inquiry harshly criticized the force's response to the April 2020 tragedy in Nova Scotia when a gunman in a replica RCMP cruiser murdered 22 people. Most of its recommendations require systemic change within the RCMP, from recruitment and training to frontline crisis response. The force insists it is making headway. For families of victims, there's still a long way to go. Specific hard changes that, that really respond to uh, mistakes or omissions, um, I, I, I think that there's disappointment that we're not hearing more about that. You say as much as you want, you know, to make yourself look good, um, but they still need to prove to the families, to Canadians, that these changes are actually being done. There has been plenty of skepticism over whether the RCMP can change now when it hasn't before. It has other recommendations to deal with as well from recent inquiries and inquests, including a federal labour investigation into the killing of RCMP Constable Heidi Stevenson by the gunman in the Nova Scotia tragedy. I want you to be able to put your trust in the RCMP. A big ask for these men, still traumatized after officers mistakenly shot up their fire hall during the 2020 manhunt while they were inside. I've said it before, and the RCMP have, they have no idea, I don't believe, what they've done to the community. The volunteer firefighters say the RCMP has yet to admit those mistakes directly to them. Heidi Petrachik, Global News, Millbrook, Nova Scotia. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau says Canada's surge in immigration is putting what he calls tremendous pressure on housing. Uh, we are uh, turning, uh, uh, turning the dial a little bit on temporary residents, whether it's international students or temporary foreign workers, to make sure that they uh, are a number that can be properly absorbed by our housing stocks. The Prime Minister says there will be measures in the next federal budget to protect renters, including a renter's bill of rights and allowing your rental history to count towards your credit score when trying to get a mortgage. Trudeau says the measures are specifically aimed at helping millennials and Gen Z.
Former U.S. Senator Joe Lieberman, who ran as the Democratic nominee for vice president in the 2000 election, has died. His family says Lieberman died after a fall. He was 82. Lieberman was Al Gore's running mate in the 2000 election and was the first Jewish candidate of a major party on the ticket for the White House. He once said he did not always fit comfortably into conventional political boxes and nearly became Republican John McCain's running mate in 2008. Mass surveillance in a war zone coming up. What Israel is reportedly doing to identify and arrest Palestinians in Gaza. Gaza's Hamas-run government is calling for an immediate end to airdrops of aid, saying they're offensive, wrong, inappropriate, and useless. <laughs> They say at least 12 people drowned while trying to retrieve desperately needed aid parcels that fell into the Mediterranean off Gaza on Monday. Another six people were reportedly trampled and killed as people tried to reach other aid packages that landed on the ground. It's not possible to independently verify that information and it's not clear which country dropped the aid. The White House confirms the U.S. is working to reschedule a high-level meeting with an Israeli delegation, which was abruptly cancelled by Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. He was angry the U.S. abstained from a U.N. Security Council vote calling for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza. Overnight strikes in Rafah and southern Gaza are raising fears an Israeli ground offensive is imminent. The U.S. has repeatedly told Israel to abandon those plans. More than a million Palestinians are taking shelter in southern Gaza trying to find safety. There are reports Israel is now using facial recognition to conduct mass surveillance in Gaza. Israel has used facial recognition technology in the West Bank and East Jerusalem to, and to search for Israelis taken hostage by Hamas on October 7th. Now some Israeli intelligence officers say the technology is being used to create a database of the faces of Palestinians without their knowledge or consent. The rush to get out of Haiti ahead, how some Canadians have taken matters into their own hands. Lawmakers in Thailand have approved a bill that moves same-sex marriage a step closer to being legal. The bill still requires approval from the Senate and endorsement from the king. If adopted, it would make Thailand the first country in Southeast Asia to recognize same-sex marriage. Global Affairs Canada says the federal government has helped 82 Canadians escape Haiti in the last two days, though some Canadians found their own way out. They're fleeing gang violence and chaos. Even schools and pharmacies have been set on fire. Food, water and medicine are in short supply and conditions are getting worse. Mike Armstrong reports on how some Canadians got out. This was the way out of Haiti for Canadian David Rochelot, a privately chartered helicopter picked up in the suburbs of Port-au-Prince. Now, this was gunfire at one of the hotels where Rochelot had been staying. It was near the airport. He had hoped the gang violence would pass and it would reopen. It didn't. Shooting was still quite active around the airport. They weren't shooting at us, but they were, you know, just trying to keep the airport closed. Instead, Rochelot and a colleague paid out of pocket for their ride out of the country. He'd been to Haiti before working on a farming project, but this time he says it felt like anarchy. It is total chaos, and the, the gangs, I think that's what they want. Now, the price tag and security situation has made chartering a flight out impossible for most. This is an operation this week by the French military. Well, according to Ottawa, about 100 people in Haiti with Canadian passports have asked for help leaving. The demand is surprisingly low. Canada's ambassador to Haiti admits officials expected more. How it's working so far is people are told to travel in the early morning to meet a helicopter chartered by the embassy. We pick central locations that are fairly safe, but you know, it's, it's always risky. There's no doubt about that. Now, the security situation is also slowing down efforts to find a political solution. The transitional presidential council was supposed to have already picked a new prime minister, but instead hasn't even sworn in its members. The council's only female representative resigned Sunday, citing death threats from gangs. Another council member resigned less than 24 hours later. The gangs appear to be trying to slow down the formation of the council to at least delay the planned UN-backed security force that's supposed to help Haiti's outgunned police force.
Mike Armstrong, Global News, Montreal. Here comes Peter Cottontail ahead, the AI twist on the Easter Bunny. Canada's 10 provinces and three territories have unique characteristics, and now a podcaster has decided to try to reflect that in Easter bunnies. He's used artificial intelligence to generate a different bunny for every corner of the country. It's an idea as sweet as a basket of chocolate eggs, unless you're in Manitoba. Melissa Ridgen goes down the rabbit hole to explain. I like to kind of just use AI to teach Canadian history or to teach about Canada in just a unique way. The creator of podcast Canadian History X thought, why not Easter bunnies? Quebec's impeccably dressed on a trendy patio, Nunavut's dapper under the northern lights, Nova Scotia's moody on a rough sea. <laughs> then there's Manitoba's, looking possibly rabid, hanging out the window of a rusted pickup truck. No, I don't like that. But he's a right track for the road conditions. You know, okay. Come, yeah. <laughs> Ooh. They did us wrong with that one. Obviously, some people interpret it as, you know, this scary, psychopathic bunny. Craig Baird used AI to generate the rabbits, which begs the question, what did he say about Manitoba to render something more watership down than friendly Manitoba? All I actually said was I wanted an Easter, an anthropomorphic Easter bunny in a pickup truck in a field. And that's the one that came out and I was like, you know what, I don't mind this one. It's not the first time his creations have gone viral. <laughs> Canadian politicians as rock stars had more than a million views. I said it's just a, a fun way to get people interested in Canada and our history, but also kind of a way to kind of break up the, the cesspool that social media can be with something that's just fun and, and people can, everybody can enjoy it. Even Manitobans. This is not who you're looking for to put chocolate in your basket this No, weekend. by no means, no. <laughs> Melissa Ridgen, Global News, Winnipeg. Yep, bit scary. That is Global National for this Wednesday. I'm Donna Friesen. Tonight's here in Canada is Old Women's Buffalo Jump near Cayley, Alberta. Thanks for watching. Hope to see you here again tomorrow. Bye-bye.